So welcome everybody to British Institute of Florence, uh, the final part of our Firenze Now Future of Florence a series of discussions about the future of Florence. Uh, and tonight the subject is towards a smarter Florence, using the word smarter in a very broad sense. Uh, the idea is to how can we build Florence back better once the COVID crisis passes. Um, and we put together a strong panel uh, to um, discuss this this, sub, this big subject, pull together all the discussions we've had so far. Um, we have in the chair, Marzio Fatuki. Wave, Marzio. Hi, everybody. Uh, and then in no, no particular order, because I can't, haven't got alphabetical, but we're going to ladies first. That's Beatrice bagali Stoffi. Wave, Beatrice. Buonasera, buonasera a tutti. Good evening, and, and then we have Sergio Gateschi. Hello. Hello, good evening. What Sergio, I should say who people are. Sergio Kataski is uh, the local Friends of the Earth leader here in Florence. Uh, Beatrice is a business consultant working particularly around the hospitality sector. And Marzio is a senior journalist at the Corriere Fiorentino, which is the Florentine uh, supplement to the Corriere della Sera. And then we have Morgan Fiume. Wave, and you're, you're muted, Morgan. Let's so wave and say hi. Um, Morgan is an, uh, a digital entrepreneur between Florence and the West Coast of the US. Uh, Marco Della Panta, who's special advisor to the mayor of Florence for higher Ed education and innovation. Um, and John Hooper, who's the correspondent for The Economist magazine for Italy and uh, the Vatican State. Uh, that is your panel. Um, and I will now hand over to Marzio, who is our moderator for the evening. Thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you for um, letting me be in, in, uh, being here. Uh, and uh, I apologize for my bad English. Uh, as a local reporter, I do practice very much and very frequently. Uh, so if you don't understand me, write on the chat <laughs> and I will try to make something better. Um, the uh, main subject of this uh, uh, panel is towards a smart future for Florence. Uh, with no question mark, uh, because this is uh, something that uh, has to be done, it's compulsory. Uh, but it's a very great challenge. Um, we we'll make a, a first round uh, of, from our panelists, um, uh, so they, uh, each of them will introduce the main subjects they want to talk, uh, to, to talk about. And uh, let's start from uh, uh, Beatrice, because uh, also she wants to give us uh, some elements uh, to introduce uh, uh, this talk. Please, Beatrice. Buonasera a tutti. Um, first of all, uh, let me compliment with Simon for this brilliant initiative of bringing together the international community with the local community to discuss about uh, key issues. Um, I want to start summarizing the um, panel on tourism, last panel actually, and then to provide you with some figures and then we go in the conclusion to, to discuss the introduction. Um, I start exactly with uh, what uh, Marzio, our delicious and uh, precious moderator, uh, show us uh, um, which was a map of Florence with uh, the indication of the dots of the Airbnb, which tripled in a couple of years. And then he said that uh, during the lockdown, there has been a 40% loss of job related to tourism. Diane Archibald, Ecomos and UNESCO, she presented the, the Florence situation pre-pandemic with the challenges of mass tourism, um, like congestion, pollution, noise pollution, uh, tourists overtaking the urban activities. And she urged for actions uh, for a more sustainable and uh, holistic tourism. Lara Fantoni, former manager of the Florence Tourist Board, um, highlighted the fact that uh, we have uh, never really understood how tourism really important is for the economic system of uh, the city and the metropolitan city. 
And she basically pointed out our original scene of having underestimated the uh, economic impact of tourism. Leonardo Ferragamo, director of Ferragamo SPA and uh, chairman of Bungarno Hotels, uh, um, told us that uh, Florence has lived tourism in a very passive way. And now the pandemic, the crisis is giving us an opportunity to rethink uh, to the city and to repropose ourselves with new strategies. Carlo Testa, president of the Toscan National Association of the Tour Operators, described the phenomenon of the congestion of the city, the commodification of the city, and the total absence of clear rules. And now I give you the uh, figures I was uh, telling and mentioning before. With, according to a study presented by the Chamber of Commerce of Florence exactly one year ago, there were 20 million of local presence uh, with an average stay of uh, three nights in the metropolitan area. The profit generated by the touristic sector was uh, uh, exceeded two billions and the GDP Mm, generated by tourism um, was uh, about around 20%. So now I give you a figure of today and uh, that I've just read in the article of uh, Corriere Fiorentino, La Nazione, of this last weekend, in which the manager of hotels were asking the municipality to uh, block the payment of the taxes, the municipal taxes, because they couldn't pay the salaries. The lack of revenue from the tourist tax uh, is uh, equal to 32.2 million. This means that tourism uh, uh, shall be regarded, maybe not literally, but very similar to an industry. And uh, we must consider tourism as one of the first generator of welfare for the economy. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah. Now we go to John, uh, John Hooper, journalist from The Economist and not only The Economist. Uh, we talk about a very peculiar aspect of our city. Uh, one of the most important things that the John, uh, that you just uh, uh, told us is that tourism is very important, but uh, Florence is still a manufacturing city. Uh, never forget that here in Florence we have some streets uh, uh, called uh, uh, Via della Fonderia, foundry melting works. Uh, okay, because we had yeah, we've always had. Uh, manufacturing system and we still have and uh, produce more GPD uh, than tourism right now. We'll see what uh, uh, what will be of Florence in the next year. But Florence is worldwide known for uh, its bottega. That is one of the main aspects of uh, its identity. Isn't it, John? Thank you, Marzio. Um, as you say, industry in Florence is very important. Um, and it's not just about exquisite products produced by craftspeople in backstreet workshops. It may come as a great surprise to some of you who have tuned in to know that the city's biggest employer is Baker Hughes. And they don't make delicate little knickknacks, they make whacking great turbines. Um, but there was general agreement among the participants in my panel, Sarah Amrine of Creative People in Florence, Giacomo Cortesi from Richemont, and Alessandro Sorani of Confartigianato and uh, Polimoda that the craftspeople were fundamental because they set standards of excellence and craftsmanship. Uh, they also uh, feed into the tourism. They add a new dimension, if you like, an extra dimension to the tourism that comes to Florence. I mean, it's most obvious the 
jewelry stores that you see on Ponte Vecchio. Um, that said, there are two levels. You've got the production in the workshops, the botteghe, but you also have a, a great deal of craft production taking place in uh, factories, so on an industrial scale. As far as the artigiania are themselves are concerned, we heard about positives and negatives. On the positive side, people coming back, if you like, into the business of making things with their hands. Um, one of the points that was made during the panel was that that is also now socially acceptable, that you can be maybe the son of a lawyer or a doctor, and there will be nothing disgraceful about you doing what in English is called a trade, doing something with your hands, if it is sufficiently artistic. Um, secondly, on the more negative side, um, and stemming from that, that there's a gap um, that uh, exists between the ages of about 35 and 55. Um, we heard that it was very difficult to find people in that age group because that was the, that coincides with the period when things weren't quite so socially acceptable. So young people, yes, 25 to 35, yes, they are coming into um, the, the, the manufacture of craft products. Then you've got the older generation, um, but nothing in between. And that has caused problems for a number of businesses in the sector. Um, other problems, lack of familiarity with and enthusiasm for what is digital. Um, a reluctance to pass on knowledge about what they do um, and a need there for perhaps for the protection of intellect, intellectual property. And perhaps most surprisingly, the most surprising thing that came out of our panel, a reluctance to grow businesses. Many artigiani apparently don't want to be like the Ferragamos of the past, to be able to start with a small bottega and grow into a multinational business. They want to stay small scale. Um, related to that, difficulties in growing, in, in accessing foreign markets because so many of them just don't have the resources to get on a plane and go to China and be able to market themselves. The big idea that came out of our panel, though, I think was that Florence has got to stop marketing itself exclusively as the place where the Renaissance, the Renaissance happened and start marketing itself as a center of excellence at all levels. Perfect, John. Uh, Florence uh, is so much uh, different things. One of these, uh, uh, so it's my way to introduce uh, Marco De Fanta, that is an ambassador or um, also um, consul of uh, the mayor of Florence, uh, a member of the um, council of the municipality council, and uh, in uh, very few uh, weeks uh, will become the um, secretary of the um, Instituto Universitario Europeo di European in University Institute of San uh, Domenico. Uh, one of the things that Florence is, uh, is also uh, places of education, uh, higher education. It's full of uh, uh, university, not only Italian, uh, and not only uh, for uh, humanistic uh, uh, subjects. I mean, uh, near Florence uh, is one of the main, uh, the most important center in Italy of art science, uh, the Lens Laboratory. Uh, Marco. Grazie, Mar Marzio. Good evening, everybody. Well, Marzio, you've said everything, so I need to say almost nothing. <laughs> no, I mean, this is a very important issue. The, the, a new vision in town, no? a, a vision which does not, of, of Florence, that does not live on tourism, on mass tourism, but on something else. 
this was a vision and this was an idea of town that I proposed to the mayor where, after my election in, in the city council. And now it becomes almost compulsory because the European Union forces us to, to have a vision about what to do with the money that the, this huge program, Next Generation EU, will be granted to the member states, especially in Italy, which was the, the country most, mostly hit by the pandemic. So my idea is that we should develop uh, a town in which, which becomes, it's already a capital of higher education, but uh, strengthen a lot this aspect. Uh, in, in, in a few words, Florence is a very attractive place, but it should attract more students and researchers instead of only mass tourists. This is something which is very easy to say, very much more difficult to, to obtain. But I mean, we, we have an asset, first of all, as I said, because it's a very attractive place. And then we, because we have a good basis, not everybody knows that uh, as regards the American students, uh, Italy is the second destination after the UK, but with very similar figures. I mean, in, in, 19, in 2019, the number of, stu of, of American students who came to Italy were just a few hundreds below the UK, which is an, an incredible figure. And among those who come to, to Italy, the, the biggest, uh, the, the great majority is in Florence. We have 45 uh, American universities. We have the EUI, the European University Institute that you must have mentioned. We have something that normally we disregard, but we have private institutions who attract uh, academic institutions or, or just, uh, I mean, uh, courses at university level who attract a huge number of, of students. We have the University of Florence. So all in all, we have 30,000 students before the pandemic, of course. 30,000 students coming in this town every year who spend a much longer period than the tourists because they stay here in average for 100 days instead of two. So that means that the impact on, only from uh, an economic point of view, the impact of, of this uh, person is comparable. It's not exactly like the, the 14 million tourist uh, uh, in terms of nights spent in town uh, that came before the pandemic to Florence, but still it's, it's a comparable figure. So it, it's an asset. It's an asset from the academic point of view, but we should do much more to create an environment which is conducive and more attractive for students. That's why we launched an initiative which was called Florence for the Knowledge Economy. That would be one of the Annelies Morgan, who will uh, speak about the knowledge economy. But I mean, there's no doubt that if we are to survive in the globalized world, we have to develop the knowledge economy. And how to do that? The only way is to have a higher human capital, let's say. So uh, you can do that by increasing your efforts in, in the academic uh, sector. You can increase it by attracting more people from, from abroad. Uh, and so what we did is to put together all the stakeholders of, the, of this uh, of the sector to create an environment which is more attractive. We try to find the financing, we try to develop new initiative in the field of higher education, we, we try to put forward and to run in a much faster way those initiatives who were already present in town. Uh, we should have created a, an event uh, in Palazzo Vecchio to, to present the initiative, but unfortunately the pandemic prevented us from doing that, but I hope that we'll be able to do it next year. But I mean, the vision that we have, that the mayor has uh, of this town is uh, the capital of higher education in order to ease at least the development of the knowledge economy. Thank you, Marco. Uh, one of the main aspects of the future of Florence uh, is the um, sustainability of our uh, city, to make a greener city. But actually, uh, Sergio will tell us that uh, Florence is quite green already. Sergio, switch on the microphone. Sergio, did you hear me? Yes. Now, can you hear okay. me? 
Okay, it's okay. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. Oh, perfect. So I think we have a, a, a situation uneven because on one hand, we have points of absolute excellence. On the other hand, we have serious shortcomings. First of all, a lack of connections between entities on planning and strategy. And I think that this is uh, one of the main problems of Italy and of Firenze. We, for every choice we have to do, uh, we have a, a huge waste of time in terms of years, years and years and years to do everything. And this is a, a thing that can kill every uh, really improvement, even about a greener city. Uh, if you think that uh, uh, to have uh, the tram lines we needed of uh, 25, 30 years uh, from the decision to have uh, tram lines in Firenze. Uh, if you think that we are talking about uh, to move uh, in some way uh, uh, the airport, not to build a new one since more than 20 years, or the same stuff is uh, about uh, everything. And there is a, a very sad story every time there is uh, some uh, big uh, asset to build. Uh, that is, uh, I think that one of the most important stuff in Firenze for everything and for uh, uh, environment too, of course, is to have uh, a place where the different uh, entities, the different bodies that rules the town and the metropolitan area, because we can never uh, think about Firenze like the municipality of Firenze. Firenze is inside a metropolitan area where a lot of decision depends on uh, even the other uh, mayors. Uh, if uh, the mayor of Sesto or of Campi disagree about uh, some uh, important choice, uh, you are quite in the panic. Uh, like uh, if you don't agree with the uh, um, uh, superintendenza, uh, it means uh, the Ministry of Art, uh, you can do almost uh, anything. So I think even for uh, the uh, environment, the first things to do uh, should be to have uh, a table to guide the necessary investments that we have to do, that we must do. Then uh, I think in the second round, I can explain what are the points, okay? But generally speaking, I agree very much of, uh, with John uh, because uh, we have, uh, of course, with Beatrice, with Marco, we have a, a town that is really dynamic, but with, I think, uh, managing and political problems. It's, it's almost, uh, I think it's very strange stuff that uh, people don't realize uh, that in Firenze there is one of the most important uh, issues about uh, big pharma. We are big pharma, Menarini, Eri Lilli, and stuff like that. We have a huge GDP uh, around medicines, for example. And when I get got inside uh, the Menarini offices, I have seen they have 180 different uh, uh, countries where they have uh, plants or offices and stuff like this. So. The, the, this is not uh, just to say, no, this is, uh, this is the, the real renaissance, you know, <laughs> you make really hard stuff that goes all over the world and you have, of course, you study, you have technological innovation, you have good management and a lot of stuff like this. So it's, it's almost, it's very strange that when we talk about Firenze, we just forget something like this. Somebody remember of manufacturing, but anyway, I think we must absolutely, we, in my opinion, we have to put at the first place the capacity of the different public and private bodies to have a place where they can take the decision if possible and or make them faster. <laughs> Thank you, Sergio. Um, Thank you. Now it's time for Morgan. Morgan Fiume, that is an Italian-American or American-Italian 
tell me uh, what do you prefer, uh, entrepreneur that made uh, his uh, work uh, between Silicon Valley and Hollywood. Now he lives in Florence, uh, and uh, one of the uh, curious things to tell about Florence and the, the recent report a few years ago. Um, we uh, realized that even in Florence, uh, we had a very big uh, video game industry and a lot of people working with that, with a lot of GDP. Um, this is one of the new kind of economy that makes a lot of uh, jobs, uh, makes a lot of GDP, uh, and is connected with the uh, um, knowledge economy, or uh, we can call it uh, culture economy. No, Morgan? Thank you so much, Matt, and, and thank you, Simon, again, for organizing these panels. I think it's a unique opportunity for the city right now to really think about how to, how to rethink itself, how to diversify, invest in new sustainable industries, and it's a pleasure being with such great panelists. So um, at the core of this is, you know, what, why is it important for Florence to have a knowledge economy, and, and what is it exactly? And for the most part, it's, it's an economy based on knowledge that derives from scientific research and technological advancements and, and innovation. Um, the key factor is that knowledge then drives growth, uh, wealth and innovation, and probably most importantly, job opportunity. And as Marco de Panta mentioned, human capital is, is probably the most essential ingredient to a knowledge economy. And human, human capital has evolved and thrived in many different ways, um, most of which is through long-term investments in, in education. Florence fortunately has a very strong, uh, well-educated workforce. The University of Florence, I think, has over 50,000 students. Um, there's also another side of the knowledge economy, which is important to understand, which I think is really not a choice because knowledge economy is actually an accelerant for obsolescence. So we're seeing entire industries and sectors basically vanish very quickly and trades that become irrelevant. This is because uh, automation, technology, taste, everything is moving at a rate that is much faster than have ever has been um, in, in history probably. The, the other thing about <clears throat> the importance of human capital, it's kind of, in the knowledge economy, it's kind of like the tide that, that, that floats all boats in the sense that the human talent is uh, Morgan, you've frozen. I don't know whether you've can come back. It's uh, the analogic that fights back. <laughs> you can't have what? a successful knowledge economy without proper bandwidth. Um, <laughs> Morgan, can you hear us? Because we lost you. Can but why you are we now? waiting? Ah, yes. Okay. okay. You're okay. back. You're Sorry. back. Sorry. Okay. I uh, apologize for that. But what I was mentioning was just that the human capital. Is, is the intellectual capital that are, that's owned by individuals themselves. So these are their skills, their talent, and their knowledge, which stays with, with them. So it's an investment in the population and opportunity for everyone. So the, the question is, how do you create it? And what, what, what components, what can the city do? Um, obviously, if there's leadership from, from the city, that's helpful. This sort of derives some priorities. What are the key industries? That we want to focus on. We can't do everything. So one of the key areas, they could be functional areas, specializations like certain tech, certain sectors like pharmaceuticals or manufacturing or robotics, or just sort of general technology or skill sets that, can, that are addressable to all of these. Then there's of course the universities, which I think can play a really um, critical role. And this is, to Marco's point, not, you know, maybe having more masters and PhD programs, more science scientific researchers, more partnerships between the, the, the public institutions and the private enterprise to create um, centers of excellence. The others are these sort of intermediary 
um, entities that can act as catalysts. These are the incubator space. These are the seed funds. These are also, um, it could be financial investors, but they could also be strategic. These are where maybe large companies can go and look for talent or give problems to young teams to try to go and solve and get sort of an out the outside uh, perspective. Followed with that is um, more uh, formal partnership again with, with established industries and finally venture capital. So all of these sort of form a virtuous uh, ecosystem that then creates opportunity, which um, draws uh, talent and, and becomes sort of a, 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 a foundation for, for innovation. So um, maybe we'll get to this in a little bit, but I would love to see some of the funding that's gonna be coming into the city to try to create these environments of innovation, let's call them, which is really a mixture of um, basically government initiatives, public institutions, um, higher education, um, learning centers, and established industries. Thank you, Morgan. Um, after this, this, this first round, uh, we can uh, absolutely say that Florence is a multitude. It's something very different uh, from the uh, a narration, the, the, the storytelling we, uh, we usually uh, have about our city. We have so many different aspects, uh, diamonds with a lot of sides. In the second round, uh, so this helped me to make the, the second round, we start again from uh, Beatrice. Uh, there are two main points because in all of you already uh, uh, stressed uh, that there is a goal to reach, okay? Uh, first, uh, how reach this goal, uh, Beatrice? And uh, the main question is about money, always. Uh, what would you do with the money or the recovery fund, this huge amount of money that uh, will uh, go um, all over Europe, especially in, uh, in Italy? What's the best investment to make in uh, Florence, Beatrice? Um, well, that's a, a very uh, crucial question and I will uh, leave it at the end. Um, well, my, the, the conclusion, uh, my conclusion uh, for the tourist sector is that we need to rethink to uh, tourism. We don't have much time because uh, when the pandemic will end, uh, we must be ready. So in these recent months, we have understood how really um, tourism weighs. And um, we have understood that tourism is not uh, folklore, is uh, business, turnover, professionalism, um, talent. Uh, it's something very serious. And um, it's not merely a question of hotels and restaurants. Tourism supports livelihood and uh, local and regional economies. Also, we have realized that one size fits all, uh, such as the promotion of only one model, generical model, of indistinct tourism doesn't work, is uh, predestined to decline. And uh, while an extraordinary personalization of the offer uh, will um, advance. So with particular attention to this uh, very peculiar situation, I see th threats, uh, the economy environment, the world recession, uh, the rising of uh, unemployment, job at risk, uh, closure of enterprises, uncertain length of the pandemic, and also the extent of the lockdown and travel restrictions. I see uh, strength because uh, tourism has a proven resilience uh, from the past crisis and the domestic tourism can be a buffer for us. I see opportunities because uh, we must rethink and we have the time, it's the right time, the sustainability and sustainable oriented segment of the offer, rural, natural, health, uh, food, wine, 
there are many things to uh, reshape. For sure, also another uh, opportunity is that we are going out, we are coming towards a new normal. The thing is that we don't know how will be the new normal, in particular for uh, tourism. So there will be definitely people wanting to travel, uh, those with uh, their each one with their own uh, demands, and uh, there will be people who will want to uh, assemble despite the risk, uh, people who will want an hyper hygienic uh, standard and maybe have uh, hyper baric chambers instead of hotel rooms. Uh, beyond the emotional conjuncture of this epidemic, anyway, we must consider that uh, we have to diversify the offer. Um, so the, the Florence must think really to uh, what will be the product to offer and uh, uh, the target to reach, what we want. We should, uh, I think, uh, um, have a strong voice and uh, also get the attention of the government uh, in giving us um, right regulations uh, and law, because what I've noticed is that there is a, a big, it's a bit chaotic uh, and there is not much um, uh, cl clear clearness in the in the legislation there aren't many rules and everyone does what they want uh, unlegal groups of people invading the town and nobody or everyone uh, ignoring this phenomenon or not noticing i don't know we must really um, uh, have tourism in the urban development agenda for example, and also draw like the main lines of uh, what is important to have a city which is sustainable and livable for everyone, visitors and, uh, and citizens. So it's, um, I think Florence has um, a great opportunity because uh, um, they, people are very interested and very focused and uh, um, must be a paladin also for other similar touristic destination that are suffering of more or less the same thing. Your question about money, what to do with money, that's very complicated because especially in this moment and especially in this situation, for sure, um, there, there will be something, uh, there will be a different approach in uh, the normal tourist. And probably structure should uh, change uh, their own uh, uh, assets, premises. For example, I'm thinking now uh, all the hotels that have invested in uh, the uh, Congress tourism, which was a very, very important sector that Florence was developing. What will they do with their beautiful hall for conferences? Maybe we should, uh, um, at, the, at this, I think we have time. So at this time, we should really stop, uh, think what will and how to change, but what will arrive and what to change according to the change. So probably we should invest more in um, arranging like, or I don't know, health, uh, first health uh, or laboratories in the hotels because from a recent study uh, of uh, a sociologist uh, that, was give, had, that uh, gave to me, there are some uh, uh, hotels that are now starting to um, uh, implement in their structure a small uh, uh, ambulatory just for first aid or to provide first, we don't know. But for sure we must uh, support uh, this sector of the economy because this sector of the, of the economy has been neglected. 
uh, has been uh, creating a lot of welfare with their own forces, not asking or not receiving much uh, financing from uh, the uh, uh, government. So uh, maybe let's sit down. It's time to sit down with uh, uh, local, national, uh, and uh, and regional authorities, uh, private citizens, visitors, uh, um, private operators, the, 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 the people in the business, and uh, discuss uh, which are going to be the, the first need and the first aid to first recover from this crisis, but then invest uh, to have uh, a better and greater uh, tourism. And change something because this is the main question. One of the things you said is very important uh, during the, the, the few months in which uh, tourism was allowed in the summer, uh, the few tourists that uh, supported the sector were domestic uh, tourist, tourists. Uh, but those tourists went obviously to the seaside, to the countryside, to the mountains, not in the, in the historical. Uh, art cities uh, as uh, uh, Florence, and this means uh, also that you have to change uh, the things that you offer to tourism uh, to change the way, because uh, you say a lot of things that I really agree, um, but uh, at the same time, a lot of tourist companies uh, just uh, stayed in this, uh, just to take this golden horde that was going coming to Florence uh, every day, like it happened in Venice. I think that's the challenge. I think we should, Florence should be like the leader and should be the pioneer in this. Uh, we must recover, we must think to a different offer and a serious, a sustainable offer. And then uh, this will be a model for similar uh, uh, cities that have the same uh, kind of uh, attraction, are historical, uh, have a lot of beautiful surroundings and so on. So, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Beatrice. John, uh, we are talking about money. Uh, you have to talk because you are a journalist of the economist who could be better talk about this stuff. I mean, what would you do with the money of the recovery fund? And are they useful? Will the, the money be useful to someone who doesn't want to change, as you just suggested before, talking about uh, our bottega, our artisans? Because money couldn't, couldn't be enough, maybe, or could, couldn't be useful anyway. I think there are areas in which the money can't help. I mean, money cannot by itself change attitudes. Um, but an awful lot of money is going to come to Italy. How much of it comes to Florence, we don't know, but we're talking about more than 200 billion euros, which no matter which way you look at it, even proportionately, is more should be, than... It should be 12, 12 billion in Tuscany, something like that. So uh -huh. we that well, that's, that's a lot of money. <laughs> A lot of money. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's overall, it's it's more than the the Marshall Plan after World War Two. So I mean, the 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 transformative possibilities of this money are very considerable. From my um, panel, we had some very concrete proposals um, the, to create digital platforms for the craftspeople of. Florence uh, or a digital platform so they can project themselves to the world. Um, education was the second proposal. Education that was digital to teach craftspeople how to use these new tools and entrepreneurial. And there perhaps you can change attitudes to try to show people what the possibilities are and how they can exploit them. And then finally, perhaps some kind of organization or some kind of system whereby the small companies, often consisting of just one person, can be brought together into a critical mass to 
go out to export markets, perhaps in the Far East, but in also in America, in other parts of Europe, to market their wares, because there is a clear problem that somebody, let's say, making dolls or jewelry or whatever in the back streets of Florence just doesn't have the resources to mount an export campaign by him or herself. Thank you, John. Um, uh, Marco, the same question, what would you do with the money of the recovery fund? Uh, and the other question is, is it possible that uh, we, in Italy we say Torre Burnia, Torre d'Avorio, the usual university uh, lives their lives uh, like uh, there was no one else around them, okay? Is it possible to make all these university connect connect to each other? Yeah, thank you, Marcio. I would be very, very uh, fast also because I see that many, from the audience, there are many requests for, for intervention. So I think we should be very, uh, very quick in, in our second round. I will say just three words. Yes, we have to invest in everything which has uh, in the long term investments that have a return in the long term, exactly the opposite of what has been done in this country in the last years and decades. So we have to invest in the long term, meaning in the strengthening of the human capital, as many of us have already highlighted. So education, research and development, uh, higher education are the key aspects uh, in which also the union asks us to, to invest. So this is the, uh, the model, the, not only economic, but also the culture, the academic, the economic model of, of the town for, for the future. Uh, ivory Tower of, of the foreign universities, well, yes, in some respect, that was my point when I, I was the Secretary General of the UI some years ago. I'm going to take over that, that function in, in one month, as, as you said. Uh, I created an event, which is the Festival of Europe, exactly to, to break this uh, Ivory Tower. I, th I think that now the situation is much better, but it has to be the municipality of Florence to create an environment in which the foreign universities don't feel like ivory towers, in which they are involved to their benefit also in the academic life in town. It's something that we have been trying to do in, in the last months and we will continue doing that. Thank you, Mark. Marco. I hope also uh, Sergio will be uh, so short but so uh, good point uh, to the things to do uh, for a greener Florence, uh, the, the, the first, the second, the third, or the three things to do immediately. You are just uh, already uh, sharing uh, documents, essentially. Yes, well, because uh, we have a strategy, the municipality of Firenze have a strategy. I don't know how much they uh, made uh, some agreement with the other public entities. Anyway, there is a strategy. And environment is in the center of this strategy, of course, because I think that we have to, I absolutely agree with the last words of Marco, because of course, we have to invest money to save our consumption, energy consumption, and to have less emissions. Uh, in the plan I put on the chat, uh, the target is uh, the 70% of consumption less. Of uh, How can we get this? We must invest, of course. We must invest in traffic, and for this there are the traffic lines, the Metropolitan uh, Railway Service, of course. But about this we have really a lot of stuff and uh, it's marching, but if we have money, part of this money has to go, of course, for public transportation uh, to save uh, space uh, for pedestrians and for bicycles uh, and to have less, uh, less for uh, cars and this not to punish uh, people, but to give people more services. And this is what happened with the first uh, 
uh, two and after three lines of tram, they save it more or less the 20% of emissions and they save it the 20% of traffic. Now we must go east. We began from west, we must go east and we must think something for south uh, of the city in according with uh, all the other municipalities all around Firenze. So traffic is one of the spots. If we have some money, we have to put to uh, develop the public transportation at uh, zero emissions, okay? Second, buildings. Buildings are another key because buildings uh, give something like the 40, 45, 50 percent of emissions in Firenze. So we must save uh, energy and investing in this sector, we can have a lot of money in the years after. So uh, we, we would, um, to put money in energy saving in buildings, in all the system of buildings, see, uh, uh, has a big meaning because in the future you spend less and every public uh, uh, body can save a lot of money and have in, the, in this balance more money uh, just because they don't spend for fuel, for gas or for uh, uh, other stuff, other fossil fuels. So this is very important. Uh, we, we, should, we need, I personally, I would like very much to put a lot of money in a district heating. Uh, we have experienced that district heating saved 30% just because you make uh, uh, a connection because of the, uh, between big buildings. We, we have also projects, old projects, but very good for some area. Uh, we have one realized that is all around the Carigi Hospital, but we have also projects for all the sport area. Franchi, rugby, rugby stadium, Africo, swimming pool, all around. One only district heating and you can save really a lot of money and of emissions. And uh, same stuff in the area of uh, Noboli, because if you could connect uh, Mercafir, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the Justice Palace, uh, uh, the bank, uh, uh, and all the stuff you could serve a huge amount of uh, buildings uh, and uh, save energy and money for the future. The third is to invest uh, to adjust the city in front of the climate change. We must have more green everywhere. We must have more green on the houses. We must have a green, the green belt that is planted. We must have more gardens. We must have green roofs everywhere, especially in the area where there is no problem about this, no? uh, all, the, all the peripheral areas where there are flat uh, roofs and where it, there is uh, no problems uh, from uh, the Ministry of Art and uh, all, the, all this kind, but you, you sh we should do it because we need to have a colder climate. The climate is going to be hot, we must have more degree and express more green see, uh, has also another big meaning that more green can stop uh, or can make uh, more easy uh, to run water. We are, we are a city where uh, a, a big rain can make huge problems. No, historically uh, we had more green it, it gives time because the green absorbs water. This yes, is. it's a protection. It's a protection. It's and a protection. among so all, all the things, yes, these, these three, are the three things. Three thing, three thing, uh, big things. First of all, we have to make an agreement between the different entities and to agree about a strategy. We have documents. I put one. I could put one hundred. But anyway, this is what I think. This is uh, the mo the most important. Then, no, no. We in Italy we are very good in documents uh, in no, no, planning. But they, uh, they work. Like the no, municipality of Firenze worked. The problem is why the municipality of Firenze didn't agree with the university, with the, the regional power, with the metropolitan area, uh, with private sector. No, why? I don't know. This is a. So, I mean, I, I, I really appreciate what the, the municipality of Firenze is, is going to do and has done, 
but there is a lack, like it, I told you. So first of all, an agreement. Second, traffic. Third, buildings, and then green, green water, nature inside. And I would add also sewers because uh, we have a province that our sewers fognature sure. uh, are. Uh, of course, uh, we make them bigger very, and new. Very, very, very old, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, they cannot support uh, anymore the quantity of uh, water of this uh, uh, big rain that we had every year, at least one one uh, in a year. Um, Morgan, you are an entrepreneur who could uh, talk about money better than you, but you are also an Italian, so you know the problems uh, of making the decision and of the governance of a uh, world territory has uh, uh, especially task. It is not one of the worst in Italy, but I mean, it has uh, it has its problems. Morgan. So my ideal scenario would be to use these funds for. Uh, turning and creating these innovation hubs. There's, this is not a new concept. A lot of countries have done this. Um, in India, for example, they have these software technology parks. They started with a handful and now they're all over. They've proven to be very successful. Israel has done something similar. But what they are, they're areas where they try to seed certain type of key growth industries, right? So they, they facilitate regulation. They invite some key players to come in. They provide training, education. And there's incentives to move and create jobs there. I would love to reflect that in the reality of Florence, where, for example, I, I came across a document on invest in Florence, and there's probably 800,000 uh, square meters of facilities that need to be uh, sold or commercialized. So instead of selling and making another uh, hotel, it would be wonderful to see um, these being turned into these innovation hubs, where we would have classes in uh, augmented in you know, artificial intelligence, in um, life sciences, in robotics, in cloud computing, in big data. There's so many requests for these jobs and we have so many good students here. They just need to have a more practical formation and opportunity. And once these, they have these skills, they can get these jobs and do smart working. They can work from their apartments and, and do them anywhere. And then have some matching fund where anyone that wants to come in and invest and hire these people, can get a matching fund from the city. Um, likewise, there's, there should be these sort of ambassadors that help navigate the system. If you're a foreign company, I mentioned in the last chapter, in, in Estonia, I can open a company in 18 minutes and do it remotely. Here, it's a big problem. I would love to have someone that could say, I'll help you. Don't worry about internet. Don't worry about you know, getting a digitization into camera di fumetro. Don't worry about this. We can facilitate all that and streamline it. And guess what? Your employees can go and have access to these uh, advanced formation. Here are companies that are looking for these skills. So start creating this, this hopefully virtuous uh, environment. But I think the city has obviously the, will have the funds, they have the real estate. So I think it wouldn't take that much to actually put some of these um, into, into practice. Morgan, uh, there is a proposal on the new planning document of Florence that's called Piano Federativo or a place like that. Instead of the new stadium in, in the Mercafir, uh, in, in the half of the, the, that uh, place, uh, they could uh, start something like that. But to start something like that, we need uh, all the things you mentioned before and amenities. Uh, it's a huge program uh, because uh, we, we, we don't need uh, only money. We uh, need uh, uh, people working on it. Uh, we need uh, competences. We need knowledge. We need a vision. We need leadership. Good luck to Florence. Simon, now it's up to you because I see that there are a lot of uh, questions uh, from uh, our public. So <clears throat> thank you very much, everybody. So now is the time where the audience can intervene with questions and comments if you're making comments please keep them fairly brief because we want to give everybody a chance to speak um so if you're on the zoom um you can uh, mention in the chat that you'd like to speak and i'll let you in uh, and if you're following us on facebook live please put your question or comment into the comments um, and I will read them out on your behalf. So um, Julia Bolton-Holloway has already put her hand up. So Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, 
I came to Florence uh, 25 years ago, and I promised I was a retired professor from Berkeley, Princeton, and so forth. I promised Fioretta Mazze that I would do everything in my power to help Florence. She was deeply concerned about the state of the city. I'm a medievalist and a Victorianist, and I'm now custodian for 20 years of Florence's English Cemetery. Cicero said, happiness is a garden and a library. And we have a splendid library, research library. Many people have come to us to write dissertations, theses, and so on. And uh, we've also been reading Dante. We had to give that up when we became the Zona Rosso. So we formed the Academia Bessarian, and we'll be meeting on Zoom uh, December 8th at 8 o'clock talking about Florence and the seven acts of mercy, how through time from the Middle Ages right on up to the present, there has been this uh, reciprocal work helping uh, the Misericordia, the Ospedale di Santa Maria Nuova, and so forth. It's a splendid tradition, and Florence could be the leader for other cities to follow suit. Uh, these are not things that are so much about money about. as they are about humanity. And they created the beauty, not the Medici. Um, so I believe strongly in this combination of handcrafts and uh, scholarship. We publish books, we marble paper, we set the books in Mo William Morris type and so forth. In the computer world, we used to say garbage in, garbage out. You can use the modern technology, but you need to bring to it all the riches of the past, not lose them. And as I've worked here with ecology, we compost. I work with the very poorest people in Florence who annoy tourists, the Roma. They have restored the garden. They build the library bookshelves. We were building two bookshelves today. I think this is the, a direction that we can go in that will maintain both the excellence of the past and the future. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Sally Caracino says that Florence needs more benches in the green space so people can sit down and, and breathe. We all agree. Uh, and Wynne has been making com comments uh, about um, the need to streamline the environment for business. Wynne, do you want to say something to the panel or should I read it out on your behalf? Wynne is not speaking. Okay. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, my comment speaks for itself. I was just, um, you know, I've been aware for years, as I'm sure you are since you live there, the bureaucracy that um, is prohibitive in Italy um, and probably other parts of Europe as well. And I was just wondering if there was any appetite for the government to um, help streamline that for businesses and industries so that they can expand and grow and, and perhaps build headquarters or at least uh, branches in Florence and the surrounding areas. Can I leap in there and just say that I thought there was a very interesting suggestion by Morgan earlier that the you know, sense that the Comune could act as a, a fire break. In other words, we know that the, the bureaucracy is a problem, but if somebody could just step in, perhaps financed with the money that's going to be coming the way of Florence and Tuscany and say to a new entrepreneur, okay, I'll take care of all of that. I will make sure that somebody goes and queues to get such and such a document that you know will help you to fill out these forms. Uh, that would be, I think, a very positive way forward um, in basically making making good on the deficiencies of the central government's approach to bureaucracy, which is the more the better. Yes, a government facilitator or a mediator, that, that would be, that's a wonderful idea. Can I Marco, do you think that's realistic? Yeah, no, no I, can I say something about bureaucracy since I'm a bureaucrat? <laughs> <laughs> 
That's what I am. I'm sorry. Let's uh, give the okay. words to my expert. No, no, I'm proudly a bureaucrat and I totally agree that public administration is something which has to be revised, at least if not reformed. I mean, it is a problem. It is a big obstacle to growth uh, in this country, not only to, to economic growth. I mean, I totally agree. Uh, let me just, but not because mm -hmm. I'm part of the public administration, let me tell you something. Everything in this country is not so straightforward. I mean, you cannot say that the whole of the public administration is terrible. There are some points of excellence and there's uh, other uh, parts of sectors of the public administration which certainly do not work. If I told you that according to a statistic of the World Health Organization of some years ago, unfortunately, maybe not now, but we have in this country the best health system in the world, you would be very surprised. And I think that 90% of the Italians would be very surprised, but I have it here, the statistics. Uh, there were continuous cuts in the public spending in the sector, but I mean, just to tell you that one should not generalize. I mean, this is a very long country. It's a, uh, and situation vary very much from one place to the other, from one sector to the other. Uh, but all in all, I totally agree, public administration is something we should really have an eye and it should be reformed. Okay. Um, so a suggestion in the comments section is that um, Stephen Cohen might make, uh, be able to tell us of some of his experience, uh, having run a lot of business in, in Italy. Stephen, do you want to make a contribution? Putting you on the spot, you don't have to. You hear me? No, okay. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. I did. You no, it's not working. Can you un can you unmute, Stephen? I did, I think. Ah. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm sorry. I I have represented for 50 years. I've lived in Florence for 50 years. It's my second home, and I love it more than anything. But I can tell you, it's not that anybody is accusing. As an American, I'm not accusing, I would never accuse the Italians who have the greatest lifestyle in the world of, of, of a difficulty throughout their system. But I can tell you from Ferrari, Lamborghini, from art dealers, from jewelers on the bridge to other businesses that we have represented, there are a few things that are impossible in Italy. One is a court system, which is sclerotic at best. So anytime we do any business in Italy, we make sure that any dispute resolution is done outside. That's number one. And that has to be streamlined. Number two, the amount of time and money spent in to comply with regulations which change regularly are a disaster. I can tell you for one large automobile company that we represented, I had to literally take them bankrupt in order to fire a crook. Now you can't do things like that. This needs the ability to work. It just wants to know with certitude what the regulations are. I can tell you my friends and clients, friends and clients really, Going crazy. No, sorry, uh, Stephen, you, your your um, uh, your line has um, collapsed on us. So I think we'll have to to, to move. Oh, are you back? No, I can't hear. I hear you. Wait You're back. To streamline those regulations, and what I'm saying is, it's hard for new businesses to do it. It's hard for very large businesses in Italy to do it without spending huge amounts of money with no real resolution. And that's a problem that really has to be addressed.
we, we, we've just got an offer coming on the Facebook Live. Um, somebody uh, uh, called Ina Lub Lubavina, um, we think from Russia, has said, um, what can I do for Florence? An offer of help from somebody. That's a nice one. Um, well, the, but I, I, I think the, the point that Stephen's making is, is super important about, uh, about um, the, the regulatory framework and, and, this, and the law courts and the rest of it. Does anyone have any uh, suggestions about how some of that can be addressed? I think the problem is that that is something that can only be addressed at national level by national lawmakers. Um, and there's not much that a comune or even a regione can do about that. Um, but I do think that this idea of creating a fire break might just work. Um, there is a precedent for this, but it's in the private sector. Um, the bureaucracy in Spain used to be absolutely diabolical and it created the, um, uh, the, 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 the a particular kind of company called a gestoria administrativa. And a gestoria uh, was somewhere that you went to to get them to deal with the bureaucracy. Now, if the comune or the regione could provide handholders just for new businesses, I think that that would be a very positive step in the right direction. And maybe not very expensive, I hope. If I can add something uh, against the laws, uh, let me be a little bit uh, patriotic. Today, uh, our region of Toscana, uh, the region government, gave the figures of the investment in task in 2020 till October. And even in this dramatic year, uh, we had one billion of investment, half more than half of them of these investments were from abroad. Uh, they were not Italian, especially American, uh, and especially, uh, obviously, in Pisa, Arezzo, and uh, Florence. They are the main manufacturing city. So, I mean, there are also good things uh, and good opportunities. Uh, um, that's why Victor Hughes' Nuovo Opinione is, uh, was a traditional and uh, with a long story. Uh, company in Florence uh, was bought by Americans, that's why Eli Lilly uh, decided to make a new uh, firm uh, here in Sesto Fiorentino. Uh, that's why other companies, uh, even Thales from France uh, or Itachi, that bought uh, Ansaldo Breda, our train system and train uh, uh, national, former national uh, train manufacturing uh, company um, in, uh, in Pistoia. I mean, there are also good things, but I agree with the American uh, that uh, used to work uh, in Italy, I don't remember the name, uh, that uh, timing uh, and regulation are, are the main problems. And I want also to suggest something uh, about the, uh, the project of uh, Morgan and uh, Marco. Uh, Gian Domenica Mendel is a uh, sociologist from Naples, but works here for. Uh, 50 years uh, and also in MIT in Boston, in Cambridge, actually. Um, I remember me in an you know, interview uh, he gave me uh, some months ago that in the United States, uh, Habermas, the philosopher, is more well known among uh, the planning specialists, the urbanisti, urbanisti, we call it them, and the people that plan uh, cities, okay, I mean, the planning of the cities, uh, because one of his um, most famous book in the United States is Planning in the Face of Power, the John Forrester, that is one of the most important planning specialists in the world. Well, this book started with a long conversation between Habermas and Forrester in a faculty club in Berkeley. Let's make a faculty club in Florence, a place in which students and teachers and professor and people that comes here to make research uh, can gather to, together and maybe the next talk uh, between uh, the new Abermas and the new Forester can give you can give us uh, uh, some new opportunities. Great idea. Thank you, Matthew. 
I, um, I don't have any more questions coming in. Um, I was just, so uh, Baker suggests all tourist buses need to be electric and Motorini need to be electric too. I think a real, Sergio and others will agree with that um, if it's possible. Okay, um, so I think we're, we're beginning to come towards the end of the session now. Um, I think uh, with your permission, Marzio, I, I'd like to invite each of the panelists to have one short uh, concluding remarks about what they think are the real priorities. Because what, what's happening next, coming out of this, is that we're going to pull together this uh, talk and the other uh, five sessions uh, into a short document, a kind of provocation or rec set of recommendations, which we will take to the Syndico and other people, leaders of the city, saying that as a result of the future Florence session at uh, Firenze now, this is what uh, the, the brain trust of the international community um, and our Florentine friends uh, suggest the city needs to do um, to seize this unique opportunity of for a reset to build the city back better. So if we could go around the panel one more time and for each of you just to record one last key point, what is the really important things to do? Um, and then we can capture those in the report. So, Marzio, steer that. Uh, sorry, but, but I lost something of your speech because uh, the line was uh, corrupted. Was oh. a question to me or to the other to, the, to all the other panelists because I didn't get it. To all the other panelists, so I was just inviting you to um, to moderate the, the, the last round. Ah, okay, but I mean, it's, 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 it's the last uh, to, uh, last round. So I mean, uh, if you have any thing to to add to what you you said, and if you have. Maybe some of the suggestion of the uh, questions uh, uh, of the people that was following who was following us uh, um, give you I mean the opportunity to say something else about because uh, you already said how you want to spend the money so let's wait for the money <laughs> and hope for that uh, the municipality and our regional will. Uh, listen to you but i mean there's something else you want to say i don't want to add any particular uh, input just um, thank publicly the director for this initiative because i think it's been important and uh, and also thank everyone for uh, giving the very, very special contribution and valuable contribution. It has been uh, interesting and I'm sure that the municipality will uh, welcome the, let's say, the, the, the final report uh, very well and take into consideration the indication that will uh, be provided. Uh, if I can step in. Marzio and Simon. Well, first of all, Simon, really, honestly, congratulations for this initiative and because it's really useful. And your idea of producing a document is very, very useful also for the municipality, for the mayor, for the Junta Comunale. So let's do that. If I may suggest something, it should not be only the ideas of the panelists. Uh, the mayor knows very well what, what is my vision for the town, so he, he does not need to be reminded about uh, my ideas, but I think also uh, it's interesting to, to, to know the ideas of the other panelists maybe, but what would be more interesting is to involve the international community as you did now in the discussion about the, fu the future of this town. So why don't we ask for inputs also from the audience that was with us tonight and also in the other sessions. Uh, if you could take maybe uh, a few more days and asking for inputs from, from the audience of all the panelists, all the panel that you have been organizing over the last uh, weeks. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I'd, I'd rather take more time to produce something useful than try and get all, all done by the weekend. Yeah, I agree. Any other concluding thoughts from our panel? Mm. 
Anybody else? Morgan? John? Yeah, I, would just add, I would just add one thing that I think, uh, you know, the spirit of this panel is really to um, brainstorm and bring in ideas and best practices. I think that the good news here is that Florence is, uh, you know, one of the most desirable places to live in, in the whole world and has a whole plethora of assets to draw up on. And most, probably the most important one is, is the human talent in the city and the human talent that is, that is attracted to the city. So if, if I think these ideas really leverage on that and it's really not at all a criticism, but rather an opportunity to build upon that to see you know, just how far uh, Florence can go, um, especially in the light of this uh, in recent year. So I think this is a really a, an encouraging conversation and one of, of hope. Okay. Uh, if I may suggest something, is that um, in Firenze, we have a lot of uh, volunteer bodies. If uh, there is people that want to do something more, there is a lot of social, uh, or social engagement possible uh, in any sector of the life of the city. Uh, and this, it, it, I think, is a really a great richness for our city. So I think you are very, very welcome uh, in all the volunteer association. And in Firenze, there are from the health to the environment. So uh, we can give answers and we can work together, really. Yes, because Sergio, this is very important. I think that a, a smarter city or a smart city is a city in which uh, there is not only technology, uh, a greener approach, uh, but uh, has to uh, also have a solid uh, social um, uh, cohesion. Uh, because if you don't have a, a community that gather together, to reach these goals, everything is obviously unuseful. Simon, I think. Uh, I mean, I think we're done. We're, we we, we yeah. said a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's lots to digest there, um, and as I said, what will happen now is over the coming weeks, and I, will, I'll, I think we'll put a bit of time into getting it right. We will put it, all this series together into a. a a document which I hope will be short and um, pointed with some um, hard ideas and suggestions for action rather than a lot of analysis. We've done the analysis, um, which we will then take to the Comune and circulate around other leaders of the city. And perhaps Corriere Fiorentino will help us to publicize it as well. Um, and that's what we try uh, to do every day. Good man, thank you. Um, so we try. <laughs> I just really wanted us to conclude by thanking very much uh, our panelists for this evening, for Marcia and John and the future, and Marco and Sergio and Morgan. Um, so many of these characters have been working with me on this from the go-get. Um, the, the, the panel this evening is really the partners of the whole enterprise. I'd also like to thank all the other panelists on all the other sessions we've done. This is the sixth or seventh altogether. Um, and also to you, the audience, for taking time out of your day to come and join us and for your thoughts and questions and provocations. All greatly appreciated. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for, to everybody and have a great night. And we'll resume in the new year with some more Ferenc in our programming, but I don't, I don't yet know what it's going to be. But I'll tell you as soon as I've got it worked out. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And good night. Grazie, Simon. Thank you for everything. Bye. Have a lovely Bye. holiday. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.